hope and pray everyone had a great Thanksgiving. So much to be thankful for. And now here we are entering into the Christmas season. So I picked out some scripture this morning that goes along with this. Galatians 4, 4 through 7 says this. But when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship. Because you are his sons and daughters, God sent the spirit of his son into our heart, the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has made you also an heir. Isn't that good? Psalm 136, 26 says, Give thanks to the God of heaven, for his steadfast love endures forever. He never changes. He's the same today, yesterday, and tomorrow. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that we can come together this morning as a church family to worship you this morning. Father, we just thank you for a wonderful Thanksgiving, Lord. There's so much for us to be thankful for every day. And Lord, we're most thankful for the Christmas season as we enter into it and celebrate the birth of Christ where Jesus came to, uh, to walk amongst us for 33 years and became a man and then lay down his life that we might have eternal life and abundant life. And Lord, we just thank you for what Jesus did for us upon Calvary's cross. And we just want to exalt his precious name this morning as we worship you in spirit and in truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can remain seated as you open your hymnals to page 85. We're going to sing the first, second, and fourth verse of the first hymnal. Service for Bill Lloyd 
And also we'll have our Christmas communion that day, two weeks from day on December the 13th. And then um, beginning in next week, throughout the month of December, we'll be taking up an offering for Lottie Moon Christmas offering for international missions. And there'll be um, some prayer guides and envelopes in the bulletin um, beginning next um, Sunday. So we just want to make you aware of that. Um, at this time, we're going to have our offertory prayer. And um, we thank you for those that have, the offering plates are in the rear. And we appreciate those that are participating, especially those at home, still at home, that are mailing in to P.O. Box 495. But let's go to the Lord and pray at this time. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can give back to you just a portion of the many blessings that you've given to us, Lord. Everything we have is from you. Um, James 1.17 says that every good gift is from above. And, Lord, we just thank you for your provision and your protection. And thank you most of all for Jesus. And we just pray that you'll bless this offering today and use it for your honor and glory. And use it for the furtherance of the gospel that many might come to know you as their Savior. In Jesus' sweet and precious and holy name we pray. Amen. All right, if you will please stand with me and turn your hymnals to page 86. We're going to sing the first, second, and fourth verse of A Little Town of Bethlehem.
I'm so glad we have a God, a personal God that we can have a relationship with while we're here on this earth. We're not to wait till we get to heaven. And it's real. If you haven't experienced it, try it. It's real. Amen. Um, also, during the month of December, you can bring your Christmas cards if you'd like in the next couple of weeks, and we'll pass them out for you. I know a couple of people brought them already today. Christmas will be here before you know it. It's three more Sundays before Christmas, December 6th, 13th, and 20th. How many of you ate too much for Thanksgiving? Let's be honest. Here are signs that you're overdoing Thanksgiving. Doctor tells you that your weight would be perfect for a man 17 foot tall. You are responsible for a slight but measurable shift in the Earth's axis. You spill more food on you than the local soup kitchen dispenses. Paramedics bring the jaws of life to pry you out of the lazy boy. The gravy boat your wife set out was a real 12 foot boat. You receive a sumo wrestler application in your email. You set off three earthquake seismographs on your morning jog Friday. Pricking your finger for cholesterol screening only yielded gravy. And then one last one, this is my son Levi. You have TV set side by side to catch all the football games. <laughs> you know, a couple of weeks ago we talked about the changing of the seasons. I love the fall. Um, I love when fall comes around. I was looking out the window this morning and the leaves were just, just coming down like rain. Uh, I love the fall, and, and yet I don't know if you've seen the weather or not. I think winter's coming tomorrow. Yeah. Tomorrow's going to be some cold, cold weather, and yet spring is just right around the corner. And we, I, once it gets cold, I love the fall, but once it gets cold up tomorrow, I'm ready for the spring. Uh, when with the changing of the seasons come many things that are so beautiful, such as the blooming of the flowers and the greening of the grass and the trees. Me and Joanne can't wait for the Braves to start back playing. But also comes the pollen and the hay fever and the sneezing and the grass will need cutting and the weeds and the thorns will begin to overtake the beauty. So with change, there are positives and there are negatives. We're going to talk about that this morning, change. Whenever new things come along in life, we sometimes enjoy the change, like the conveniences of modern day technology. New and improved are words that we see often as we now live in the 21st century. But at the same time, we often long to hold on to the past. Uh, the old way of doing things seemed to be so much better. Uh, sure, life was harder back then when we were younger, but before all of these modern day conveniences, but life was so much more fulfilling and a whole lot less complicated back decades ago. But once again, with any change, there are positives and there are negatives. Uh, of course, years ago when we were younger, life did not seem to be so busy as it is today. Time just flies by so fast today. Life was slower and not so rushed, and especially family time was something that was special and dear to our hearts. We didn't let too much interfere with it. I remember when life was like sitting on the front porch on the Andy Griffin show. Or like living on Walton's Mountain. Good night, John Boy. Wasn't life back then just grand? Uh, don't you sometimes yearn to go back to those slower paced days? Back when families used to sit at the table and actually eat together? But what about all the modern day luxuries that we now have? How could we get by without them? Life was real tough back then. I remember I had a, a friend one time in one of my former churches. He said that he was 10 years old before he realized that his name was not Go Get Wood. <laughs> and those of you with gardens, don't you just love your tractor? Or would you rather have to fight with that old mule again? I saw a man up in Fairburn a couple years ago using an old wheel plow. How many of you wish you still had those old black and white TVs where you, with the rabbit ears that you had to go up and adjust to try to get a better reception from time to time? And better yet, how could us guys live without our remote controls? When we were kids, some of us were the remote controls. Our kid parents would say, go change the channel, turn the TV up or down. 
Ladies, do we get by without our microwaves and all the conveniences of cooking in a modern kitchen? An auto mechanic's job would be a lot simpler if we just had to change out the points and condenser. And now everything's computerized on our automobiles. Now you're lucky if you can get one finger underneath the hood of a car so packed under there. Remember when you could literally crawl over into the engine compartment to work on a, on a motor? But two areas of our life that have surely been made more convenient is email and cell phones. Or have they? Have they made life more convenient or more complicated? Uh, we now live in the fast lane like never before, hauling our kids up and down the road it's here and there. Parents are like taxi cab drivers and going through drive through windows, eating fast food all the time. And yet some folks don't want to let go of the past. Many choose to live like the Mennonites do, and they, they don't want to take advantage of all the new and complicated ways of living. But they are few. Most of us want to run out and get the latest gadget when it comes out if we think it'll make life simpler. Do you remember when kids used to actually play outside? <laughs> Those days are almost gone. But with life, many changes. With life comes many changes, and many are for the better. But then also we have to give up a lot in how we used to do things. But that's okay. Change is good for us. Now, a lot of people don't like change, no matter what. They want to live in the past, and they would rather do anything than have to change. This is the way I am, and I'm not changing. Have you ever known anyone like that? Or uh, All of us have, are that way from time to time, ourselves to some extent. We don't want to change, and we're not going to. But here's what we're going to talk about this morning. God, on the other hand, has another idea. God is in the changing business. And He changes lives for the better. He takes people from death to life. He takes people from condemned to forgiven. He takes people from lost to saved. He takes people from without hope to eternal life. From bondage to sin to being set free in Christ. He takes people who are deceived and opens their hearts to truth. And in order to do that, we have to change. Not only do we have to repent and learn to trust in Him and His righteousness and stop trusting in ourselves, but even after we are saved, our life as a Christian, if we grow as a Christian, will be changed, will be filled with change. Whatever, whether we like it or not, we're going to, God's going to change us. And God wants to change us. He doesn't want to leave us like we were or there wouldn't be anything to our salvation. With our salvation comes change. And He is the one that does the changing. We don't have to worry about trying to change on our own. He will take care of that if we will just surrender ourselves to Him and let Him change us. So look with me at our text this morning, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. This should be a very familiar verse to you this morning. It says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ Jesus, he is a new creation. The old has come, the old is gone, and the new has come. Let me repeat that. This will be a good verse for you to memorize. I'm sure you've heard it your entire life. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. What an awesome verse. What, a, what an awesome truth. He made us a new creation. Yesterday, I, I had to wait on my wife in the car for a few minutes, and I clicked on my phone and um, clicked on social media, and I saw a video. Now, listen to this. This is some, some modern-day technology. I know a girl that lives in Honduras. Um, a couple of my kids have been on mission trips to Honduras, and this girl named Maylee lives in Honduras. And she put something on Facebook. It was a live stream of a funeral from West Virginia. And I knew the gentleman preaching this funeral. His dad died. He's a pastor friend of mine. He pastors a church in Douglasville. And he coaches at Landmark Christian School. And there's a lot of people here that know Fred Gilkes, Gilkes in the day. Um, we saw last week that he went to West Virginia because his uncle was in hospice. And while he was there, his dad got COVID and died. So here was Fred. I looked at my phone a while. There's a live stream. Clicked on it and listened.
listened to Fred for a few minutes preaching at his dad's very own funeral. And I want to share some of the stories he shared with us that day. It was really interesting. He grew up in West Virginia. Um, his dad must have really been hard and strict and uh, a hard man. And him and his brother grew up in that atmosphere. And he said that uh, he told a story about when him, him, him and his brother were helping his dad dehorn the, the cows about when they were little. And, and he told about how when Fred was little, he went to a, a church camp and got saved. Fred got saved, but his dad was not saved. And um, he said that he, he rode the church bus for two or three years to church. And his dad wouldn't go. His dad said, I'm glad you're going. He said, but that's for you. That's not for me, but I'm glad you're going. But he says he, he, he knew his dad knew about God. He had a respect for God. Because one time, Fred said there was a preacher preaching on the radio. And he was just hollering and screaming and and Fred was a little boy. Fred was making fun of him. He said, I was about eight years old. I was making fun of that preacher. And he said, my dad stopped me and said, you better stop that talk right now. And he said he had a respect for God, but he didn't know God. And then Fred choked up as he preached his dad's funeral. And he said, then he met him. He met him. And he talked about the change. Now, we all have things in our life that change us. And we were different from before it happened and after it happened. His dad had met the Lord and he was never the same. He told a funny story. I'll tell you real quick before I go on my message. He said one of the ways that he changed, he was growing in his relationship with Christ. He said he loved to read these books by a gentleman named Louis Vorman. I think he said. I'm not sure. I tried to look it up. I couldn't find it online. But he, he said he, he loved to read these books by Louis Vorman. And he was growing as he read these books and learning about the Lord after he got saved. And he said, these Louis Vorman books were just laying all over the house. They were just everywhere. And he said, one day, his wife, and I think it was his daughter, decided to have a yard sale. So his wife thought, well, I'll get rid of all those books that's just been laying around the house forever. So she got up all those books and took them down to his daughter's house and had a yard sale. So Poppy went down to, to, to the yard sale to see what they had. He saw these books from Louis, from Louis Vorman, so he bought them and took them home. <laughs> <laughs> Not knowing that were already his, his books that he bought. He said his wife said when she found out, she said, well, at least I made a little bit of money off of it. <laughs> but 5, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. I want us to take a closer look at this popular verse of Scripture from God's Word this morning. There are two words that are very, very important. Of course, they all are, but especially two words that I want us to think about today. What are they? What, what would that be? New creation? Old and new or, or what? How about if and in? I want to talk about if and in real quick. First of all, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. If. This is very important because not everyone is in Christ. Not everyone who claims to be a Christian is a Christian. Not everyone is on their way to heaven. You must be born again. And you will be changed. You will be different than you were before. You must be a new creation. This is what takes place if and when we acknowledge that we are a sinner. And then we ask Jesus to forgive us of our sins. And we ask Jesus to come into our lives and to save us. And if and only if we do that, then the Bible says that we will be saved. And that we will then become a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. If and when you become saved, you will change. You will be a different person. You will become a child of God. You will inherit eternal life. You will be forgiven and washed in the blood of the Lamb. And you will receive His righteousness. It's not possible to go through all of this and not change. You will be different. Uh, apart from accepting Christ as your personal Savior, if you never do this, then you will not be a new creation. Instead, you will be your old self. And you will be lost and without hope. If you are not saved, you can be today. Salvation is a free gift. And God wants to change you and give you a home in heaven one day. So this word if is very important. It's not like some people that just assume that everyone goes to heaven. If is very important. If and only if you are in Christ, 
which is only possible by trusting in Him as your personal Savior. Second of all is the word in. The word in is very important. Unless a person has been saved, then they are not in Christ, and therefore not a new creation. The old will be gone. It will still be there. But if and when we trust in Christ, the Bible says that we are in Christ. And when we are in Christ, then we will be new. We can't be in Christ and still be like we were before we were saved. Instead, we are a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come and it's all good. If you've experienced it, you know it's all good. When we are saved by repenting of our sin and believing in Jesus, we become in Him. Just like in John chapter 15, you can go home and read that this afternoon. It talks about like a vine and a branch. In John 15, we are in Jesus. We are in Christ like a vine is in a branch. And that is the beginning of eternal life in Him. And nothing can take that away from us. Uh, the Bible says that nothing or no one can snatch us from His hand. We're going to look at that in just a minute in John 10, 28. Nothing. We, we are secure forever and we are a new creation. And I don't believe for a minute that we can go through that and then revert back to being lost. Um, I, I want to stop right here and just pause for a minute, talk for just a minute about the eternal security study that we're going to do beginning in January. I'm starting to become aware that not everybody's on board with Charles Stanley's opinion that we are eternally secure. He wrote this book back in 1990, and I've always been taught this way and always believed this way. And, but I'm starting to realize, you know, a lot of us come from different denominations. Where there's probably several here this morning and such a small crowd. Others that are listening on, on video that come from different denominations or different backgrounds. And, and when we're taught something, we believe it. We usually don't want to change. And so I'm not trying to convince anyone. But yesterday, um, I did a little research on some, some famous preachers to see who all believes in this. I, I just Googled, and you can do the same thing if you want to. I just Googled, did Billy Graham believe in eternal security? Or did James Merritt, does James Merritt believe in eternal security? Listen to the names that I found that support this. Charles Stanley, of course, he wrote the book. His son, Andy Stanley. Billy, I'm going to give you some information on papers next week, and we'll make some copies if, if anyone's interested in reading what they had to say about it. Billy Graham, Franklin Graham, Max Licato, David Jeremiah, Mark McClellan, Greg Laurie, Michael Youssef, Adrian Rogers, Rick Warren, John Piper. And that's just some that I've looked at so far. I'm going to keep studying it. I don't mean that every, you know, just because a lot of preachers believe it, that it's, that it's so, but, but I believe. And in this verse, John 10, 28 through 29, is one that came up a lot in the papers that I printed out. John 10, 28, 29 says, I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. Now for the big question. Have you ever known someone who was supposed to be saved when they didn't change much? You were positive that they had truly and genuinely trusted in Christ as their Savior, but not much changed. They just kept on living like they did before they were saved. Maybe this was you. Well, this morning, I'm not going to get into all the questions of were they actually saved or not. Yes, there are many who just think they are saved, but they must not have wholeheartedly believed in it. You will hear testimony sometimes of people who later in life truly got saved after being unsure before. But the New Testament says 40-something times that all you have to do is believe in the name of Jesus Christ. John 6, 47 says, He that believeth in me has eternal life. The Bible says throughout the book of 1 John that you can know that you have eternal life. You just know you're a new creation and His Spirit indwells you and His Spirit testifies with our spirit. And also, I don't believe that it's our duty to be the judge of whether someone else is truly saved or not. That's between them and the Lord. And yet the Bible says that they should bear fruit. 
unfortunately, many people think that they are saved when they are not. But you, and you had better be for sure. This is serious business. And then, unfortunately, there are many others who do truly get saved, but they don't do a whole lot of changing after that. They get saved, but then tragically, they never grow much as a Christian after that. They don't get involved in the local church, and they don't spend much time with the Lord on an individual basis, and they just don't seem to change very much. And this is tragic. God wants us to change all of us and mold us into the very image of His Son, Jesus Christ, and yet, yet there are many that miss out on this. They actually miss out on life. They miss out on His life. And He wants to change all of us and make us a new creation. And then the old will be gone and the new will come. Change will take place. Now, here's a little illustration. It's kind of like going to Disney World when you were a kid, maybe for the very first time. I was in my mid-40s when I went for the very first time, but, but think about maybe the first time you went to Disney World. Can you remember looking forward to going and, and, and finally that day arrives for you to go and you enter into the gates and you get inside and then that's it, that's just as far as you get and then you go home. How disappointed you would be to know that you were so close to seeing it all and experiencing it all and yet you never got past just inside the front gate. That's how it is if we don't allow God to show us the rest of the story. And not just when we get to heaven, but now here in this lifetime. Salvation is just the beginning. Uh, that is when our life in Christ is supposed to begin, not just after we get to heaven. The moment of salvation is when the sanctification process begins, and it lasts a lifetime from the moment of our salvation until when Christ comes to take us home. And Christ Jesus has promised us abundant life here in this lifetime. And that comes when we walk through life with Him. I'm so thankful for the abundant life that Christ promised us. And on a daily basis when He fulfills that promise. And he wants to make us a new creation. He wants us to change. He wants to change us all for the better. And the old will be gone and the new will come. Will you let Him is the question. Or are you so wrapped up in the old, you don't want to let go? The old way will never satisfy. Not if, not if you are now saved. God wants to give you a new life, His life. Now when we are lost, before we are saved, God will love us and accept us just like we are. He loves us unconditionally and He will love us and save us in spite of our sin. But then something happens. Something wants you to be just like Jesus. He wants you to have a heart like His. God loves you. You might want to write this down. Think about this. God loves you just the way that you are, but He refuses to leave you that way. Think about that. God loves you just the way that you are, but He refuses to leave you that way. He wants you to be just like Jesus. And that's why He wants us to make us new. And He wants us to... to he wants us uh, to make us a new creation. He loves you just as you are, but He refuses to leave you that way. He has something much better in store for all of us. And yet, in the beginning, God loves you just the way that you are. He loves us unconditionally. If you think that His love for you would be stronger, stronger, you are wrong. If you think His love would be deeper, if your thoughts were better, wrong again. Or even serving Him more. Don't confuse God's love with the love of people. The love of people often increases with performance and decreases with mistakes. It's conditional. But not so with God's love. He loves you right where you are. Romans 5, 8 says that He loves us when we were yet His enemies and steeped in sin. Here's some words I took from a commentary that says this. It says, God's love never ceases. Never. Though we spurn Him, ignore Him, reject Him, despise Him, disobey Him, He will not change. Our evil cannot diminish His love. Our goodness cannot increase it. Our faith does not earn it any more than our stupidity jeopardizes it. 
God doesn't love us less if we fail or more if we succeed. God's love never ceases. The Bible says God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Aren't you glad that we can't stupid our way out of blessed being loved by Him? If anybody could mess this up, I probably could. But God loves you just where you are, but He refuses to leave you that way. He loves us way too much to allow us to miss out on the blessings that He has in store for us. And that is why He wants us to allow Him to change us. And it's all for the better. His life is more than we can even begin to fathom. Uh, let me ask you this morning, are we willing to accept God's love to the extent that we will allow Him to change us? Or do we just want to accept God's love enough to be saved but not changed? Maybe just get to go to heaven one day. I I've been counseling with someone over the phone recently that has a couple of grown kids that are trying to straddle the fence. And they are saved, but they've been out of church for many, many years. But now they're beginning to go back to church just a little bit. And they're trying to straighten up a little, but they're hanging on to the old. I can remember being there before when I was a teenager, torn between the old and the new. But God wants to change us completely, not just a little bit, but completely. The old has to go so that the new can come in and change our lives all for the better. I promise you that God's way is so much better than our way. So much better than anything that this old world has to offer. Listen to this story by Max Licato. Max Licato is one of my favorite authors. I want you to try to picture this scene as I tell you this story. He said, when my daughter Jenna was a toddler, I used to take her to a park not far from our apartment. One day she was playing in a sandbox and I saw a ice cream truck go by so I went and I bought her a treat from this ice cream truck and when I turned to give it to her I saw that her mouth was full of sand and to put a delicacy she had put dirt did I love her with dirt in her mouth absolutely was she any less my daughter with dirt in my and her in her mouth of course not was I going to allow her to keep dirt in her mouth? No way. I loved her right where she was. I carried her over to the water fountain and washed out her mouth. Why? Because I love her. Let me ask you this morning. Can a mother or a father love their children unconditionally? Can a mother or father love their children unconditionally? Do you think a mother or father can love better than God? Love is so much more powerful and so much bigger than anything that we can ever imagine. So I don't know about you this morning, but I for one am so glad and so thankful that God loved me enough to refuse to leave me like I was. Because I was in such a mess. And He reached down in His loving and almighty hand and literally pulled me out of the miry pit of sin. And it's been nothing but awesome ever since. And I had to change. I had to change my behavior and I had to change where I hung out at and who I hung out with and I had to change how I acted and how I responded to situations and to other people. And you know what? I'm still having to change every day because I've got a long way to go before I can be just like Jesus. But I'll get there one day. And you'll get there one day. Probably not completely until I get to glory, but I'll get there. Not this is how I am and I'm not changing. But you know who did the changing in me? The changing occurred within me, but God was the one that did it. It was all God. I just had to relinquish my rights of doing my own thing and allowing Him to have His way in my life so that He could change me. And it's an everyday process still today and tomorrow and the next day. If I try to do it on my own, I'm going to fail. God does for us what, just what Max Licato did for his little girl. He hoses us over the fountain and he says, Spit out the dirt, honey, our father urges. I've got something better for you. And so he cleanses us of filth and immorality and dishonesty and prejudice and bitterness and greed. And we don't always enjoy the cleansing. Sometimes we opt for the dirt over the ice cream. I can eat dirt if I want to, we pout and proclaim. Which is true, we can. But if we do, the loss is ours. 
God has a better offer. He wants us to be just like Jesus. In order for us to be just like Jesus, we have to change. Or should I be, or should I say, be willing to allow Him to change us? Are we willing, or would we rather just keep on eating dirt? I promise you, His way is so much better. Are you willing this morning to give God the permission to do whatever He decides to do in your life to make you more like Jesus? Let me read that question again before we pray. Are you willing this morning to give God the permission to do whatever He decides to do in your life to make you more like Jesus? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just pray right now that you would come and just change us, Lord. Just come and change us. Lord, we can't do it on our own. We can try. We can try to live perfect lives. And we, we can try to, to, to not sin, Lord. I had a professor one time in Bible college that asked us if we could go five minutes without sinning. And we can, Lord. And he said, well, then you ought to be able to go all day without sinning. But, Lord, we're human. I was thinking about that driving down the road this week, and I thought, oh, I asked the Lord to forgive me for everything, and I'm going to try to, to, to live better. And, and two minutes later, I'm griping at somebody in traffic. Lord, and I realize I had sinned that fast. Because we're human. That doesn't mean we have a ticket to sin. Lord, we need to try to, to live our lives as righteous as we can for you. But thank God we can allow Jesus to live his life in and through us. And we don't have to try to do it on our own, in our own strength. Lord, thank you for the free gift of eternal salvation. And thank you that you promised to not let anything jerk us out of your hand. Father, we thank you that we're secure and we're going to spend eternity with you one day in heaven. Lord, if there be anyone here today that's not sure of their salvation, Lord, I pray that they'll make it right today. That they'll trust in you and put their trust in you and not in themselves or not in something that they're doing themselves, but only in Jesus. We just love you. In Jesus' sweet name we pray. Amen. If you will please stand with me as we sing our invitational hymn on page 307, Just As I Am.
Sandy Cheney. Sandy Cheney's Wade's cousin, I think. Yeah, or his cousin. He's got brain cancer. Got brain cancer. Mm -hmm. Becky. Do you remember our family and pray for Alicia and Steve, the girls, to travel home. Yeah, Benny and Becky's daughter just left this morning to drive back to Kentucky, so pray for them. Pray. There are a lot of families. We, we talk about this on Tuesday and Saturday on the conference call. There are a lot of families that are estranged and people not getting along, different things. We need to pray pray for those families. I know we've had some of this in my own family, and it, it's tough. All right, anyone else? It's good to have Taryn here. I talked with Jerry, and... Um, he said they were doing pretty good. Ethelene sleeps a good bit. Yeah. And he said one day her mind is just clear of everything, and he said the next day she's out in left field. But yeah, I've tried to call several times. I've left a couple messages. A couple times I didn't get an answer, but yeah. they, I think they replay my messages for her. Um, pray for Ethelene. All right, if nothing else, we'll turn it back over to Levi. All right, we're not going to hold hands, but if you're seeing the benediction alongside me, I've decided to follow Jesus.